Okay. Well, you've, we've not had a marker board behind me the whole time we've been over in the other room, but I teach in here at 8 o'clock. Therefore, there's been a board in here, so I get to mark all over the board in the mornings and all of that. So this is what we've built so far. So far, we've built the, the, the lineage of what is happening through the book of Daniel. Daniel is not in chronological order, so we've had to put it in chronological order. And I know some of you have asked for this in a chart form. Here it is. It's going to be in your very last lesson. It'll be an appendix that I'll put onto the lesson, the very last lesson, uh, so that you can uh, have it for your um, reference. Chapter 1 had to do with... Daniel being taken off to Babylon and the, eating the vegetables, if you remember that, not eating the meat. Well, lo and behold, Daniel 1 is totally fulfilled. For all of us who have this ooh feeling about the book of Daniel and it's all about prophecy, yes, it is, but much of the prophecy is fulfilled, as I've told you. Daniel chapter 2 is about the statue of gold. 5 6, the that prophecy is fulfilled. We're waiting for one more event from that chapter to be fulfilled, and that event is for those ten toes to join back together by themselves. Germany will not be involved. Switzerland will not be involved. Iraq will not be involved. Russia will not be involved. Iran will not be involved. Um, all these 37 nations and everything that have joined the EU, which is really having a struggle right now, and that whole economic uh, uh, chaos that was formed by all going on to one currency, and everybody, all the old prophecy guys says, this is it, this is it. And I kept saying, no, it can't be because it's the wrong countries. It has to be the right countries that join. There's only 10 of them. It can't be 27. It can't be. Right off the bat, there was 13, and I went, Wait a minute, there can't be 13 countries, there's got to be 10. And so it's these 10 countries that are going to join back. That's all that's got to be happen. And when that happens, then it'll be time. Listen, when John wrote the Revelation, the last book in your Bible, this wasn't, they were only down to the belly of iron and the two legs of iron had not even been formed yet when our uh, New Testament was completed. When the whole Bible was completed, they just got the belly of the iron from that statue, not the legs. We still have to have the legs and then the toes to be formed. And the toes are formed, but now they have to reunite according to that prophecy. Daniel chapter 3 is all about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Totally fulfilled. Totally fulfilled. Nothing in that chapter needs to be fulfilled. We come on down to 585. I mean, come on down to uh, 585. We've got the dream of the tree. Nebuchadnezzar has that dream of the tree. Totally fulfilled. That's about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the tree is he's going to be chopped down, go out for seven years, and then rise back up and take over the kingdom. Totally fulfilled. 539, the four great beasts. Three of those beasts have come. That fourth great beast has one little part of it that it has to reunite together. Uh, the, the, the ten horns off of that last beast have to come back together. The same issue that has to happen with the statue of gold. So three-fourths of that is complete. So we come on down to uh, 538 in chapter 8. That's the story of the ram and the goat. The ram is two horns. It's Persia and, um, and uh, Medo-Persian Empire is the ram. And then the goat is the, um, is the Greek Empire. The one-horned goat, is horn breaks off. Four horns come out. That's the four generals that end up taking over virtually the world at that point in time. That's already coming gone. The Greek Empire is gone. The Roman Empire is in. Totally fulfilled. Chapter 9, where we were last week. Uh, I call that, that's in 536. It's 70 years. Daniel's reading in Jeremiah's scripture, and he sees that the, the total time that that temple in Jerusalem is going to be desolate and the children of Israel are going to be punished for their sin is 70 years. But then it goes on to talk about the 70 weeks. Well, that's just about fulfilled except for one quarter of it. And what has to happen with that is that very last week, the last seven days, the last week, which equals seven years for the tribulation of Israel, not for the world, but for Israel, has to transpire and it will come sometime in our future. So it's not fulfilled. Now we're in chapter 6, same year, 536 B.C., 
It's the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And I have to report to you, it too has been totally fulfilled. So let's all go home. We'll make it to Luby's, right? <laughs> if it's fulfilled, what are we studying it for? Well, first of all, it's one of the favorite, favorite stories in the Bible. Yes, sir. The first beast, the first beast. What do you mean by the other great beast? That's right. The first, the first one is, um, what is the first one? I just went blank. Somebody pull that lesson for him. Give me a copy of that lesson. Uh, chapter 7 lesson. Do y'all have a chapter 7 lesson? He needs a chapter 7 lesson, and I do too, because I just went blank. Okay, one is, a, one is a, 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 a lion with wings, and that is the Babylonians. The next is the Medo-Persian, which is the bear with three ribs. The next is the leopard, and the leopard ends up with four heads. So that is the Greek empire. And the last is this beast that has ten horns, and a little horn comes up. See, I remember this stuff, but I want him to know it. So we need to find him a lesson seven. That way he can uh, catch on to it. Well, here, let's go. Why in the world would we study about Daniel and the lion's den? Because it ha happened to Daniel. And once again, this is a lesson that is just comforting for us to know that God is faithful to take care of those who belong to Him. No matter what your circumstance, and I don't care who you are in this world, somewhere in your lifetime, you're going to find yourself feeling like you have been cast into the lion's den. It happened to you in elementary school. It happened to you in junior high. It happened to you in high school. It happened to you in college. It has happened to you in the workplace. Well, all of a sudden, everything is going just fine and dandy. And the next thing you know, you feel like you're being thrown into the lion's den. And you go, what did I do? Well, here we go. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Now, it seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Okay, time out. You're looking in your scripture that I've copied, and you see a pair of uh, parentheses, and you see wording that I have marked out. If you go to your New American Standard Bible, 1977, right there to him, 1970, Scott. Scott, to Scott, 1977, and you read your preference, preface, folks, you have to read your preface of every Bible you pick up. If you want to do King James, do King James, I love King James, read the preface. Find out how the book's put together and what the markings mean in it. If you're an NIV person, I love NIV. I tell everybody, if you want to read something for ease of reading, to read the Bible as a story, read the NIV. Read it. I'm fine with it. Read the preface to find out how it's been put together. If you want to do New American Standard, which is the closest to a word-for-word -word translation of the Scripture that we have, read that. However, you have to remember, this was in Hebrew... Some of Daniel was in Chaldean or Aramaic. And in the New Testament, we got Greek. Well, in all three of those languages, they don't even talk right. Did you know that? They tell the action before they tell who did it. You got it? Where we always tell who did it and then the action. So in order to translate any of the original manuscripts into English for us, we have to take what they have and do this to it. And then in order to pick up what we know so we can understand it, we have to add words like the and a and I'm and your and this because they're implied in the language, okay, uh, with an ending, with a suffix or a prefix. It's implied in that language. So, and they know because they're writing a sentence and the whole sentence is in this feminine text. I mean, do we have really feminine text in English? I don't know much about English. Do we have a feminine and masculine presentation throughout? No, but in all these languages they do. Uh, you know it's talking about a gal because it's in the feminine form or in, in Chaldean, in uh, Aramaic, or in Greek. Um, or it's in the masculine form. Or it's in a neuter form. You know that. We don't know that. So somebody has to interpret it for us. In the 1977 New American Standard, 
which is what this text is from. I am not a fan of the 1995 New American Standard because it has been redone by a committee that is very, very Calvinistic, very, very um, mm, God saved you and mm, you're not saved and mm, yes, you are saved. And that committee of folks who are very Calvinistic, uh, high church folks have reworded things in the New American Standard 95 edition that um, lean is not quite accurate. They say, okay, well, this is 2012. Why are we worried about the 95? Well, back in, 19, um, back in 1977, when they finished the editions, they didn't, then had to start printing them up. And Bibles are not printed, just boom, boom, boom. They print them in mass, and they sit in warehouses, and they sell them to their, till they're gone, and the 95 edition was finished in 95, ratified by the committee in 95 to be the changes. And then they started having to typeset it and print them. And they hit our bookstores about 2008, 2009, because all the 77s are gone. You got that? They're going to sell their product. This is all about product, about selling it. They're not going to discard those good Bible 77s. So here we are. We've got them here. It's here. It's here. And if we read the preface, we find out in the New American Standard 77 version that anything that's in parentheses is a thought that is somewhere else in the Bible. But some well-meaning editor wanted to help you understand what's being said. So they've moved that thought and they've placed it in the Scripture. Trying to help you. Now, folks, it's here. It's down in, in verse 4. This is where this thought is down in verse 4. We'll get to it when we get to it. But they put it up there just to clarify it for you. Well, it doesn't clarify anything. It just kind of messes it up. It's very easy to read across here that over, after, uh, over these three commissioners, the satraps might be accountable to, uh, to them. So if they put it in there and said, oh, Daniel's one of them, that just breaks up the thought line as far as I'm concerned. So I mark it out. If it's in brackets in the New American Standard, it means that thought that has been placed there by some editor, some preacher, somebody to help you understand better, uh, that thought is nowhere in the Scripture. He's just trying to say in English, this is what it would mean. You got that? So I mark those out. If it's in italics, that means that English word has been put in there to help you understand better in English what's being tried to say. say. You'll notice I skip all of those because those are not words we need. I have never seen any place in the New American Standard where we actually need those words. The New American Standard is already kind of rigid enough as it is, very archaic. It's not like the NIV that just flows. But the NIV is not a word for word. It's a thought for thought. Now, I have no trouble with that. I believe in my heart, my heart is that it does not matter what scriptures that you are looking at, whether it be the uh, New American Standard 1995 version or the ESV or the CEV or the, the, the Message or the Living Bible or whatever. What God is protecting is the content of the message, not the actual words. And so, and you say, well, how can that be, Jim? Well, back in Nehemiah chapter 7, they'd come back from Babylon, which is fixing to happen in 536 B.C. The King Cyrus, in this year that we're studying this lesson today, is going to say, okay, all you Jews, it's time for you to go home. And they're going to get to go back. And when they get back to uh, Israel, back in the southern kingdom, they're going to start searching through. They're going to start doing things to rebuild the temple. And lo and behold, Ezra is going to show up and they're going to find the old scrolls. And Ezra in chapter 7 of Nehemiah is going to start reading those scrolls from morning till night. And all the people from Babylon who were Jewish, who moved back home, don't speak Hebrew any longer. And Ezra is reading in Hebrew. And in Nehemiah chapter 7, we find that some of the old men, see there is a good reason for old men, all right? The old men stand around in the crowd and as Ezra reads it in Hebrew, they are translating it into Chaldean or Babylonian. The first translation of a Bible of any passage happens in Nehemiah chapter 7, 536, 537, 538, some along this period of time. I guarantee you they are not translating it word for word, but they are translating it thought for thought. And those people are turning their hearts around and giving their hearts to the Lord.
So I am more conservative than most, and I just do not just believe that the original transcripts were uh, inspired. I believe that God is protecting the Scripture all the way through because it's the content of the message. My heart's been that way forever and forever. That's the reason why I go so fast in order to tell you the entire story of a lesson instead of focusing on one verse, and then I start telling you what I think about it. It doesn't matter what I think about it. What matters is that you get the content and the concept of what God is trying to present to us in that entire story. That's more important than the word the or the word a. What does the word the mean? What does the word is mean? What does the word a mean? For the Jehovah's Witness folks, they get all, we all get all hung up, say, oh, that word A is not there in 1 John 1, 1, and you've put it in there. Well, pahooey. The point is, is whether it's there or whether it's not, it doesn't change the context of the content of that passage. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Word, and He was here from the very get-go. And he's always existed in the word A. The article A doesn't change anything in that message. Dar and these little phrases they put in, I marked them out. Well, Darius has seen fit to break up the entire brand spanking new Persian empire into 120 little blocks. And he's assigned a satrap to each block. Now, that old Persian word satrap means the protector of the realm. What that means is that this satrap, his job is to protect that piece of land and the people who live on it and the government entities and the things that happen in the Persian Empire on that land. He is to protect it for the good of the king. Now, just in case that satrap has a problem, Darius also decided to put three commissioners over the satraps. So each commissioner had about 40 satraps that he was responsible for. So satraps uh, reported to the commissioners, report, commissioners reported to Darius. So that's the issue. Why? Because they wanted to make sure the king might not suffer loss. That no portion of the land, there's always some look body looking out for the plot of land. Now folks, I got news for you. Houston's so big, there's absolutely no way any one person could look out for the good of the Houston area. We have four commissioners or five commissioners in Houston. I don't remember. El Franco Lee's one of them, and so I think there's four. Uh, is there four? There's not enough. Do you know there's not enough? There really is not enough. No, no, there's not enough. No. But I did hear a good thing about... Uh, no, I'm not going to tell that. That's terrible. I can't tell that one. Anyway... We, we really need more people who are looking out for good. I call the commissioner's office fairly often. I had to call him this week. And lo and behold, boom, they're Johnny on the spot. They're finding something out for me, and they'll get back with me. And it may not be what I want to hear, but they will get back with me in the next week or week and a half and tell me what uh, answer to my question. And they go to bat for us. They go to bat for us. When we needed to get on down the road with a permit from Harris County, lo and behold, we finally had to make a phone call to El Franco Lee. And within uh, about five or six or seven hours, our answer was there, and our permit was in hand. It had been there a month. So there's sometimes what you have commissioners for to make sure their office rolls right. Well, that's what these satraps are for. All right. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to anoint him over the entire kingdom. Well, whoop de doo, Daniel. Hmm. If he is not 90 years of age at this point in time, he is approaching 90. Remember, he is at least 14, 15, 16, or 17 when he's taken out 70 years before. So he's getting up there towards 90 years of age. He's still got this extraordinary spirit that God is upon him, and he does well. And let's just put it, he is an old man. And for some reason, Darius has grown fond of Daniel, and he is going to place him as third ruler in the kingdom. It's not a new spot for Daniel. He's had better than that. Seventy years before with Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel is only two years out of the southern kingdom, he is 
16, 17, 18, or 19, he's made second in command of the entire Babylonian kingdom. Remember that? Right over there. Chapter 1. Right over there. So we've got this going on. This is 70 years before. Daniel held that position until Nebuchadnezzar died, at least. And then he held other positions like that where he was in control. He's not even a Babylonian. He's a Jew. And his cream has risen to the top to where everybody wants him to be in leadership in their kingdom. He is an amazing man. Well, he's got this... Uh, the Darius has made it known to everybody that he's going to place Daniel right under him. And the commissioners are going to have to report to him. The satraps are going to report to the commissioners. The commissioners are going to report to Daniel. And let's see how that sets well with the commissioners and the other people. Verse 4, Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. A Jew, not even a Babylonian, had handled the business of the Babylonian Empire perfectly, honestly, for over, right at 70 years. And now Daniel has made a seamless transition from the Babylonian Empire and the Chaldeans to their enemies, the Persians and the Persian Empire. And he's just moved over. He is honest. He, is, he handles the business perfect. And so these commissioners and these satraps have got it in for Daniel. Now, I imagine some of those satraps were young whippersnappers. You know what a young whippersnapper is. You know what this is all about. Most everyone in here, you're old enough to have been through this in your lifetime. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. They've got you there in the business, and you're doing mighty well. And lo and behold, you'll notice that they start weeding you out. Just about the time for retirement, they start weeding you out just before you become vested in your pension funds so that they do not have to put their 6.25% into your money. So they find a way to get you out, and they're hiring these young whippersnappers to come in, and they don't know nothing about nothing. They don't know the ways of the corporation. They don't know how things are done. And besides that, when they do put them in and they see that they're going to put this old man, almost 90 years old, in charge of them all, what in the world? This is a new day and age. Why in the world would they put that old man in that position? What about us? We want to take this company to new heights. We want to do this in a new and different way. He doesn't even listen to the right music. He doesn't even talk the right language. Man, I'm telling you what, he likes that old music with a lyre and the harp. Slow down playing. Oh, man, we are into the mambo drums and uh, five-string banjos. What is in the world is he doing here? And we like that rock stuff. Well, you can do that, okay? He dances like this. We like to do like this. What in the world is this king thinking about putting Daniel in this position? Oh, my, here we go. He's not even one of us. He's a Jew. How did racial discrimination? This is racial discrimination. The king is discriminating against everybody that's part of his kingdom. He doesn't even recognize that Daniel's not even one of us. Yeah, he is. They're cousins. They are cousins. Can you believe? They are upset. They are upset. Oh, I'm sure it really makes some of them mad if Daniel came along and said, okay, Mr. Satrap, I'll, I'll, I've got this new young man. I think he's really doing pretty well. You know, he's only 17 years old, but, you know, I was 17 one time uh, 90 years ago and uh, 70 years ago, and he says, I, I want you to train this young, new young man that I have. And so that satrap takes him in, and he trains him in all the ways that he's supposed to be trained, and he gets him up to speed, and he's doing really well, and then Daniel comes along and says, now this is not in your scripture. I'm just making this part up. <laughs> Daniel comes along and says, you're doing so well, young man. I'm going to put you in charge of all these satraps. The next thing you find is, I trained him. He had me train him, and now he's my boss. How dare Daniel put that young man that I trained that young snotty nose things. My stars. I had already been working in this business before he was even born. <laughs> Y'all, you've heard all this before, haven't you? Some of you felt it. Yeah. 
And the problem is, is what you have to do. If you trained him and he becomes your boss, most people don't realize if you trained him and he becomes your boss, you automatically have an end with him. But no, you sever that relationship because you get upset. You see, if you would not act so bad towards him when he becomes your boss, you will go along with him. Now listen, the Lord does that on purpose to see what kind of character you have, your character, so that you don't gripe and murmur and complain. How many of y'all parked over at Dobe, I mean over at Beverly Hills this morning? Okay, we had just gotten on the bus. Next thing I know is I start hearing murmuring, complaining from the back of the bus because of the way we're coming to church. We don't take the direct route. We come all the way around the ditch on Beamer. And, I th and all I can think about is, oh, my soul, these people in the, in the bus, these people did not learn the lesson from the wilderness experience with Moses. <laughs> I was afraid Beamer was just going to open wide up and we were going to fall in. murmuring and complaining. You want to tell the bus driver where to go? Well, the truth of the matter is the bus driver had been told which route to go and which route to go back, okay? And you didn't like it because it wasn't the most direct route and you thought you were late. You know what? God is never late. It's always on time. And if you're two minutes late, God got you there exactly when you were supposed to be there because he was in control when you locked your keys up in that car and stepped on the bus. <laughs> This old man, Daniel, we got to get rid of him. And so they start looking at Daniel's life. You know, he's a Jew. He's been looking at the Babylon. He's been ruling the Babylon kingdom for all practical purposes for 70 years. Surely he can't run the Persian kingdom and Medo Persian kingdom either. And they look at it and say, sure enough, he can. Oh, yeah, he can. He has seamlessly transitioned to be not only a good Indian in the, per in the Babylonian Empire, but he's a great Indian over in the Persian Empire too. So they don't have anything they can do to, tell, to catch him in any sinful act. Well, we're going to turn the, turn the page here finally. <clears throat> and we get to verse number five. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground of accusation, accusation against this Darius unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. He's not going to break any of the rules of the kingdom unless we do something that causes him to have to decide, am I going to do the kingdom? Or am I going to continue to live by the principles that I learned before I was sent into exile in 606 B.C.? They're going to have to put something in there that causes him to have to choose his God or the kingdom. So what do they do? Here's it. Then this commissioner and the satraps came by agreement. Ooh, collusion here. To the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. Remember, that's our term. Long live the king, except it's in this, the way they said it then. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that everyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. You can't tell me that that is a true statement. I know good and well that not every satrap wanted to be part of that. I know good and well that not every governor wanted to be put of that, be along with that. I know good and well that every commissioner did not want to be part of that because I know people. People have not changed. All You think old things were different back then. No, they got up in the morning just like you do. They went to bed at night just like you do. They put on their clothes just like you do. They showered and took their baths a little less often than most of you do. Only because it was a little more difficult. They did not use deodorant because they did not have it. They didn't, they didn't brush their teeth regularly like we do. But they still thought like we do. And people think like we do. And you have these leaders and you have these don't. And we have a collusion of some leaders that have got everybody to go. Now these people who don't want to be there in front of King Darius are in a tight spot. If they go against the other satraps and the other commissioners and the other governors, then they will be blacklisted on the governors and satrap and, and uh, commissioners list. And if they stand with the king and go against 
them, I mean, I'll go against the king, oh, then the king is going to blacklist them and then they'll lose their job. So do they want to continue to get paid? So I'm sure a bunch of these satraps, governors, and commissioners, governors, by the way, are more like sheriffs. They just showed up and kept their mouth shut, and a few did the talking. You know how that is? And they said, see our mass in number? We all think, well, I have been in enough church life to know that two or three may stand up and say, we all think, and we all ain't thinking that way. Most of the people are going, well, I don't really agree with that, but I'm too shy to say something about it. So they make this thing, and they want to have a petition made, an injunction of which for 30 days no one can make a petition or a prayer to anyone except to Darius himself. Verse 8, they say, Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius, sign, sign the document that is the injunction. So, they've got this document ready for King Darius. They've just approached him. Put your signature on it. And according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, it'll last for 30 days and it cannot be revoked. Now, we've heard that all of our life. That's, we, and that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, a law never could be changed. Yes, a law of the Medes and the Persians could be changed. A permanent law was voted on by the satraps, the councils, the commissioners, and all of that in a regular order of business. And once the king signed it, it could be changed by, by that law or a replacement law coming back through the entire process in the usual manner of business. However, injunctions that lasted for a short period of time that did not go through the usual process could be, could be signed like a, an executive order And that could not be changed until it was either fulfilled and the time was up or somebody else became king and wrote a new order. November the 6th, <laughs> sometime between 7 and 7 o'clock, you need to go make sure that we're writing new orders. Okay? New Okay? I do not care who you vote for except for a member of our class. We have, a, we have a member of our class. His name is Robert Talton. He's running for Harris County uh, attorney. And because he's a member of this class, I can say it. I'm not telling you to vote for a party. I'm not going to tell you to vote for this or vote for that. I'm telling you, you need to support We Know Him this is not the devil we don't know. This is the one we do know, and we know what his intentions are, and we know what his ethics are, and we know what he will do. We know what he did for 16 years. Okay? New orders. New orders. To help the commissioner and the county judge, the commissioners and the county judge, want this man, Robert Talton, to be the next county attorney. They don't realize what they have probably chosen, but I hope the people choose him. All right? You can't go any higher than that. That's the one I'm worried about right here. <laughs> now, if you were just to make application on up and down the flow chart when you go, I will let you do that, but I, I cannot say that. I can say it about our, our member who belongs to this class. I can say that. And if we had another one in here, I'd say that about them, okay? I would not be, it would not make any difference here as long as it's a good person who is doing the Lord's will. Well, in the midst of this, Darius, for some reason, signs this order and it's good for 30 days. Because it's an executive order, it cannot be changed until the 30 days is up. Boom, 30 days has to be up. That's the only way around it. Now, Darius doesn't realize, but he has put himself in what we might call a pickle. And he'll find that out in just a few minutes. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Three times a day. Huh. Daniel knows this injunction has been signed. He knows it. He knows the content of the injunction. 
And yet he still makes the choice to go to his private house and to continue praying to his God three times a day. Daniel will not break the principles that he has lived by all his life, and that is to give honor and praise and communion with his God three times a day. Actually, in the Old Old Testament uh, way of doing it, it happened five times a day, the break of dawn, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and as the sun is going down, five times a day. But whenever the temple was destroyed, there was no way to do sacrifices that represented what was going on at the temple any longer. The Jews held on to the uh, tradition and to the honor of praying to the Lord three times a day. Yes, sir. Sure. Why did Darius sign it? No, Daniel knew the contract. Darius is the one who signed it. Darius signed it. Daniel, but Daniel knew. He was not without knowledge, and still he went to his house, and uh, he continued to pray. And look here, verse 11. Then these men came by agreement. That means they all joined together and said, Okay, we got him now. It won't take long. Darius signed this at 2 o'clock. I don't know what time he signed it, but we could say he signed it at 2 o'clock. Okay, Daniel ought to be up to break this... Uh, Law here at 3 o'clock. Let's head to his house and let's see if we can catch him. So these men by agreement came and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. These scoundrels did not have to wait very long. After the thing is signed, whenever it's signed, I don't know when it's signed. They only had to wait till the next prayer time. They knew when his next prayer time was because he stopped doing business in the kingdom to go have his few minutes of prayer time every day of his life that he was in exile. They all knew. He's the boss boss. He's just under the king. That's where he's always been. And now it looks like he's going to be placed under him again into this place of position of high. So when it came time for his prayer, I'm sure Daniel did not say, uh, I'm going to have to y'all to go out of, the, out of the door here for a while because I've got some private business i got to handle. No, he probably says, it's time for me to do my prayers. Could you want to join me or do you want to step outside? And Daniel went his prayers. Daniel did not hide what he did. Folks, that is an important principle for everybody to understand. Never hide your Christianity. Never hide the things that you are supposed to do. Never be afraid to bow your head and say, Thank you, God, for this food. Amen. And that's what I do. And you may say, That's redundant. You say the same prayer every time. I am thankful to God for my food. Amen. And everybody hears it. You don't have to pray a long prayer so that everybody in the entire restaurant can hear you going on um, uh, how does Brother John say it? Washing an elephant, waxing an, el oh, waxing an elephant. That's what Brother John says. Waxing eloquent, but he says waxing an elephant. I don't know why he does that, <laughs> but he does. <clears throat> so that everybody can hear this stuff. They're already going, okay, my quesadillas is getting cold, you know, while you're going on for, just thank the Lord. That's what it's for. But don't hide what you do. Never do something different than what you know you should be doing. And Daniel wouldn't do that. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. And look what these scoundrels do. Huh. I'm sure that they've seen Daniel probably 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. This is either the third day or the fourth day. We don't know how long it was, but they have probably seen him do this at least six times. And they show up to Darius and say, Darius, we've got a question. Didn't you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast in the lion's den? Folks, whenever somebody asks you a question about something you do, before you answer, you need to back up and go, okay, where's this going? Why are they coming asking me about something that I know I just did? This can't be good. Anybody who's do, who does that has, a, has horrible intentions. I promise you. You go and steal some policy at your company, and two days later, the guy, person who comes up and says, didn't you make this policy? And you go, yeah, I did. Because they're happy. Because now you made the policy, and somebody just broke it. only bad thing about policies, in my experience, and this is 100% true, 
Every policy that I have ever heard made at Sagemont Church by some ministry, do you know who's the first person to break the policy? The head of the ministry. And he makes it. It always works that way. You know what I'm talking about. Y'all have lived through this. Somebody will come along and you'll make a policy. This is going to be our new rule. Okay, well, we're not going to use that rule right now because, you know, these circumstances are a little different. Policies need to be very, very careful, really done. They need to be very, very general. They need to be very, never specific. But this stupid injunction, did I say stupid? I sure did. Was for the purpose of putting one person in his place. It wasn't for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No, it was for Daniel and Daniel alone. They wanted something done with Daniel. Policies should never be put in place for one person. If you've got a problem with one person in your business, handle that one person. You know, my ministry, Josh has left my ministry. Charles is stepping down, although you'll hear his voice regularly. uh, He's not going to be there. So now we're down in the office, two of us, and we're going to make some changes. And this is the perfect time is to make some changes. But bless Charles's heart and Josh and Sally. The doors are open. I hear them. I can hear through the walls because the sheetrock's paper thin over there. And I'll hear him say something. And I cannot tell you how many times I opened the door and said to Charles, Charles, the next time you say something, say it like this. I don't go make a policy over here to how you're supposed to say something. And then put, no, I went to Charlie and said, Charlie, you know, say it like this next time. Charlie's been CEO. He's been head of all these company president of all these companies you know you just go and and i found you know you you handle charlie who has been all over the world and done everything in creation with borg warner and teledyne and what are the companies oh my soul you've lived all over the world you lived in sydney with borg warner you've lived in canada toronto Ohio, Pennsylvania, California, sent in to build the new warehouse, hire the people, stock it, train them, and go do it again someplace else. And with Teledyne, you were what? What? With Teleflex, you were what? President of Marina. I mean, every place. This is a man who has had people by numerous people underneath him. I go in and say to him. Then I got Josh. Josh is just struggling to pass basic college math. You got it? And I treated them the exact same way, and they both responded the exact same way. And Josh came along. Probably one of the finest. I have never had a single complaint from anybody about how Josh handled them in the last six years. Not one. I cannot say that about Charlie. (laughs) I cannot say that about Sally, and I really cannot say that about me, okay? But never Josh took instruction when folks making policies. They made a policy just to get Daniel where, he, where they wanted him. So the king answered and said, yeah, the statement's true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. It's a 30-day injunction. Even I can't revoke it. All right. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. I imagine as soon as they said the word Daniel, Darius went, oh, no. He pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petitions three times a day. Hmm, how, How long do these officials watch Daniel transgress this law? I'm sure they see him six or seven or more times. I've seen, I'm sure they've watched him and now they've got him just right where they want Daniel. And verse 14 says, And then as soon as the king heard the statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on what? Delivering Daniel from that injunction. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Talking about Daniel. I'm sure as soon as he heard Daniel's name, he says, oh, no, not Daniel. See, that's what happens. You set a policy. All those of y'all who've been in positions to set policies or, or bylaws or whatever, somebody breaks them and you go, oh, no, not Sally. Oh, no, not Charlie. Oh, no, not. It just breaks your heart. 
And so he can't break this law. So until sunset, till it gets dark, he keeps trying to think, how can I get Daniel out of this? What can I do to get Daniel out of this? And at sunset, these scoundrels come to Darius. These men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Can you imagine? Here it is. No statute can be changed. All right, Darius, you better keep the law of the statute. Now you think, well, we've got... Darius can change it. No, Darius can't because he's not number one in the kingdom. These scoundrels, if Darius does not keep this law and do something with Daniel and throw him in the lion's den because that's what the law said to do. It's very specific. If he doesn't throw him in the lion's den, then they're going to appeal to Cyrus and Darius is going to end up in the lion's den because Cyrus is going to keep the injunction because even Cyrus cannot break it either. So Darius cannot change the law. He has nothing he can do. He's going to have to sleep in the bed of nails that he has made. So he says, and the king gave the orders. And Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, he came and saw him. And Daniel goes in and says, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Oh, this is not like the people at the foot of Jesus on the cross saying, where's your God now to save you? No, 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 that's not the way it is. This is Darius saying, I've heard about your God. I know about your God. And the God that you serve, I know that he will deliver you from this punishment. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it. They poured wax, so it doesn't say that, but that's what they did. He sealed it with his insignia ring. He, they sealed it with the signet rings of all those nobles, and so that nothing might be changed in regard to Daniel. Daniel has to stay in that lion's den. Nothing can be changed. The stone is over it. The rings have been in the wax. No soldier or anybody can change anything until, until morning. I don't know what those satraps and those governors and commissioners did, but I imagine it was going to be a party like, right, like, just like after election day or something like that. Because they had won. I'm sure some of them went out and got drunk that night and had parties. And they spent way into the middle of the night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, if they even got home before 4 o'clock, I would be surprised. And they finally got home and they're sleeping in their beds because Daniel is right where they wanted him. That he has, they have won. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night not eating, fasting, because he's grieving so bad he can't eat. And he doesn't allow any entertainment to be brought before him. And his sleep fled from him. He can't sleep all night long. He tossed and turned. Have any of y'all ever tossed and turned all night worrying about something? Yeah, I've heard from some of y'all. Yeah, when the market took a turn and I kept saying, get out, get out, get out, and you didn't. And then you slept every night. You're going, oh, oh, I'm going to do my retirement. I can't retire on this. Oh, I've lost half my money. You laid up all night for weeks. Worrying about what you're going to do. Yeah, you've done it. Everybody's done it. We've all done it. Some of us just cannot handle things like that. I learned real early, I, especially whenever you had to wait for the Wall Street Journal to come the next day to find out where the stock price has closed the day before because you didn't want to bug your broker. I couldn't handle that. I just could not handle waiting until the next morning. I'd lay up all night wondering what it closed at. Did it close at? So I know what, whether I should get in or get out the next day. That was 30 years ago. I just couldn't handle that type. I mean, that's just something I can't handle. Some people can handle it. I can't handle that. I can handle a lot of other stuff, but I can't handle that. Well, then the king, the king arose at the dawn and at the break of day, and he went in haste to the lion's den. And when he come near to the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troublesome voice. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? I wonder how long Daniel waited before he answered. Do you think there was that long silence? When Daniel's going, oh no. Imagine he was quite comforted that he couldn't hear the growls of the stomachs of the lions or even the growls of the lions, period. Their mouths were shut. He didn't know it. He didn't know what had happened to Daniel. He heard nothing. 
O Daniel, has your God that you serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Nothing but the deliverance of Daniel matters to the king. He has kept the law. He can, if Daniel is, if there is half a life in Daniel left, he can pull him out of the lion's den now because he kept the law. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever, for my God has sent an angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, inasmuch as I have I was found innocent before him, that's God, and also toward you, that's Darius. O king, I have committed no crime. Others in Daniel's position might have been angry with Darius. Mm -mm, not Daniel. The lions have not harmed me, Daniel says. He says, I have committed no crime. God has told me that I have committed no crime. And he said, I have not committed a crime against God, and I have not committed a crime against you. Even with his injunction, I have not committed a crime against you. Now for us, we'd say, yeah, he did. No, in God's eyes, he didn't. And that's all that matters. Folks, all that matters is what God thinks. And so as a good king, Darius cannot break the law he has signed. And so he does not break the law. And sure enough, the king was very pleased, verse 23, and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury was found on him because he had trusted in God. Did the officials sleep well that night? Mm -mm, no, they partied. They're not going to sleep well here in a minute. Daniel has been re resurrected out of the lion's den. Not one single lion even licked on Daniel to say hello. Because an angel is protecting Daniel. Then the king gave orders and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. And they cast them, their children and their wives, into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Darius says, okay, my friend Daniel, I'm fixing to make another order. And this is the order. I want you soldiers to go get every single one of those satraps and those commissioners and those governors who who were vocal and making me sign this bill and I want you to bring them and I'm declaring they will be pushed in the lion's den. They bring them, them, those men, plus their wives, plus their children and they're all pushed into the lion's den and before they hit bottom, the mouths of those lions are opened up and they begin devouring those men. You say it's not fair for the wives and children to be punished. Show me a place in the Bible where the head of the household is not responsible for what is going on in the house. It may not be the lion's den with real lions, but I got news for you. The way you act at a work in a job will affect how your family eats at the house. The way you treat your bosses will affect how they treat you, which will bring a blessing or a curse towards your family at home. The way you spend your time at work and not at home with your children and your girls and your boys because you don't have time for them because you've got to be out doing this other stuff will affect what happens at the house. And the way you run your mouth surely will affect how what families and your families will pay the penalty. It just happens in here. They're going to lose their life. Then Darius, <clears throat> the king wrote to all the people, nations and men of every language who were living in all the land. Listen to this wonderful decree. May your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the domain of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. If you hear about the God of Daniel, you fear and you tremble before him. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. How does he know that? That sounds like it's coming right out of the book of Revelation. A kingdom that will never be destroyed. Look on, he says, an enduring domain that will endure for, I'm mean, sorry, and uh, cannot be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. How does Darius know this? I'm sure he has heard all the stories about everything that has happened with Daniel all these past 70 years, and he knows that Daniel's God is the true and the living God. He delivers and he rescues, he performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lion's den? When you get to heaven, get ready. This Darius is going to be there. He did not have to be chopped down like Nebuchadnezzar and go wild for seven years. 
He did not have to throw three Hebrew boys into the fiery, fiery furnace to learn that there is a God who is a living God whose dominion will live, which will go on forever. No. He's learned his lesson. He's a smart man. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a wise man who learns from his mistakes. It's a very, very smart man who learns from the mistakes of others. And Darius has evidently learned from mistakes of others. By the way, Darius is going to die this year. He is not going to live more than just a few months after the lion's den. And I wonder, who was the lion's den effect event for? Was it for Daniel or for, was it for Darius? Well, I think it's for Darius because it brought Darius to the Lord. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Well, that's going to be short-lived. Darius dies in just a few months later in 536 B.C. It's been a full year, that 536 B.C. Cyrus is going to end his rule in just about six years when he is fighting up near the Caspian Sea in 530 B.C. He will die. Cyrus' son, Shambius, will take his place and he will reign until five, September of 522 B.C. And then a different king, a king by the name of Darius I, who is no relation to any of these other Dariuses or Shambius or Cyrus, will take. There'll be a, and we'll talk about this later. There will be a, a coup, and they take over the kingship of the Medo Persian Empire with a king by the name of Darius I. And then finally, Daniel is going to have some more visions 15 years later. 15 years after this event, There'll be more visions, and that's where we're headed next week. More visions, and Daniel will be wet at a hundred if he's not 105 to 108 years old. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have, we will not hear any more. You actually did not hear about them in this reign, but we hear that they ruled back in another lesson with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's over in chapter 3. We hear that they ruled with Daniel until the fall of the Babylonian Empire, so they ruled, ruled till 530. Uh, 536. Sometime in the next years they will die, but Daniel will live on over the next 15 years, and he will have this wonderful vision. So that's where we'll pick up next week. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. You, will fa you were faithful to Daniel, and you were faithful to keep Darius' prayer for Daniel, that you would take care of him and deliver Daniel, and you did. Why would we think that you would be any different with our prayers and our petitions and your promises that you have for us. Those that are in your will, you will keep. May we find your will in everything we pray to you. In your name, amen.